In a moment, I'm going to be speaking about a man who began to count his blessings before he saw them. And I hope that if you are down and discouraged, that you start counting the blessings that God will bring your way. The stars that Abraham began to count was the stars that God promised. And so he, by faith, believed that God is going to do it. And you can too today, by faith, believe that God is going to do the impossible in your life. Stay tuned. Whenever we are given the silence treatment and we feel, notice the word feel, doesn't mean necessarily true, but we feel isolated and we feel confused. But here's the problem. We tend to take this same experience, that same feeling with our relationship with the Lord. And we misinterpret his silence when you don't hear from God and you feel that God is silent, that you think that God is angry with you, or God is mad with you, or God, God is giving you the silence treatment. I think many of us, if not all of us, at some point have experienced the silence of God. I know I have, and I remember some time ago, many, many years ago, when God just was silent in mind, I really needed to give me direction and guidance. I was so desperate for him, but God was silent. God was silent. I remember, I remember clearly one time I said to God, I said, if I don't hear from you, I'll die. That's just an exaggeration because I tend to be a drama queen. Uh, my family know that. <laughs> But, beloved, I want to share with you what I have learned from these experiences. God uses silence. And, of course, God is always speaking to us through his word. I'm taking that for granted. But when you are praying specifically for a specific item, for a specific issue, and you feel that God is silent, sometimes his silence, just like words, they have meanings. God uses silence for his redemptive purposes. You see, the important thing is for us as believers to discern the purpose of God's silence in the situation we're going through. And to be able to do that, you have to understand that at least I'm boiling them down to five times when God is silent. Five times. If you're taking notes, I'm going to speak a little slowly so you can write them down. I believe even in the times when God is silent, He is working on your behalf. He is working on our behalf. He is working on my behalf. But even when He's silent, even when you say, what well, I can't hear you, God, why I can't get you to answer my prayer, God, where are you? The first silence of God is what I call the silence of judgment. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, I give you the background. Eli the priest, he's in charge of the tabernacle. But his two sons were running wild. They were living in rebellion. They're living in disobedience to God. And the problem is not just that, but it was Eli who was acquiescing and not saying anything to them and not speaking to them. And God, out of judgment for that silence and the acquiescence of Eli, he stopped speaking. Until God raised a young man by the name of Samuel. You remember the story when Samuel kept coming back to Eli and said, Did you call me? Did you call me? And he said, No. And he knew in his heart that God is about to speak again. And he said to him, Samuel, when you go back, when you hear that voice again calling your name, say, Speak, Lord, your servant heareth. That's what I call the silence of judgment. The second type of silence could be the silence of mercy. Notice I keep saying could be, because <laughs> I don't want you to take it and say, well, Michael said this. It could be the silence of mercy. You see, by saying nothing, sometimes God is exercising mercy on us. He really is. He's exercising mercy to give us time to repent, to give us time uh, to come under conviction, uh, to give us time to reflect on his incredible grace and mercy and love. 
So rather than God, you're thinking God is angry with you, God is mad with you, he is not. He, he is giving you time to reflect. He's giving you time to relish in his mercy. You need to be grateful for that silence. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us in Romans 2, 8, he said, don't confuse God's silence of mercy with his tolerance of sin. Some people do. Well, God didn't do anything, must be okay. No, it's not. That's the silence of mercy. The third silence could be the silence of testing. You know, Job suffered like very few people have ever suffered or will ever suffer. I mean, and I know when people are going through a tough time, they go and read Job, and, and by the time they finish, they say, man, I don't have any problems. <laughs> I mean, this man lost everything and the pain and the suffering, physical, emotional, spiritual. I mean, he was in absolute mess. But, you know, I want to submit to you that Job's greatest pain was that God would not answer him for a long time. Sometimes that silence is a silence of testing. It's like Jesus said about the widow who kept on pounding on the door of the unjust judge. She kept on pounding on the door. He wants to see how long we're going to persist in trusting him and keep on knocking. And don't give up. The fourth silence could be the silence of waiting. Sometimes God waits. He waits until we become quiet so he can speak. We are constantly rushing and running, 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 running our mouths. And God says, okay, I'm going to wait until you calm down so I can begin to do my work. I want to explain this to you. There is a difference between persevering, which is the silence of testing, and the silence of waiting, which is ceasing to strive. Do you know the difference between the two? Is our attitude. It really is. It's our attitude. Do we keep on asking out of absolute faith, unshakable faith, that God will answer, or are we keep on hammering away, fearful that God will not answer? That's the attitude. That's the difference. See, like the Canaanite woman who came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 15, beginning at verse 21 to 28, she came to Jesus interceding on behalf of her daughter. She came to intercede. She kept, Jesus kept trying to change the subject. She goes back to it. Every time Jesus tried to distract her, she goes back to it. Read the dialogue when you go home, and finally Jesus said, what a great faith. She would not be deterred. Then the fifth, finally, it could be the silence of love. There are some occasions when words distract from a message. Did you know that? Often when God has no words of instruction for us, he always has that in his word, in the scripture. But it's, it's the times when we're specifically praying about something or seeking God for something. And when there is no word of instruction for us, is that he wants us to rest in his love. That's why he's silent. He wants you to rest and have confidence on who he is, what he's done for you, that he died on a cross to redeem you, to save you eternally. And he wants you to rest in his love. Now I want you to turn with me, please, to the Word of God in Genesis 17. Because the first thing you notice is that God has been silent for 13 years. 13 years. We left Genesis 16 in the last message where Hagar came back to live with Abraham and with Sarah and she was there for another 13 years because she came back a changed woman. God changed Abraham. He changed Sarah. He changed her. God changed everything. And so she comes in and there for 13 years. At the end of chapter 16 in the Genesis, the Bible tells us that Abraham was 86 years old. Between the age of 86 in Genesis 16 
In the age of 99, in Genesis 17, there is absolutely nothing recorded in the Scripture. There's nothing recorded in the Word of God. Thirteen years of silence between Genesis 16 and Genesis 17. I'm so glad we got the whole Bible now. Because remember, back then they didn't. Don't ever forget that. He didn't have the Scripture. He didn't have the Word of God. He didn't have Bible teachers. He didn't have radio and television programs. He didn't have churches and fellowship and small groups and home groups where you can encourage one another and uplift one another. They didn't have any of that. But we don't know why those 13 years of silence. Maybe because there was nothing important that was happening in those 13 years. We don't know. Or maybe because God wanted Abraham and Sarah's faith to develop to such a degree that it becomes unshakable faith. Or maybe God was trying to imprint on their hearts and in their minds the consequences of their impetuous sin of running ahead of God and not waiting for God. Or maybe God was trying to bring them to the end of themselves. Maybe God wanted to be sure that Abraham was too old, that his seed is dead, that no matter how much younger the woman is, he ain't going to have children. It's because he's 99. Or it could be because Abraham had grown to believe that all is well in his life with Ishmael. I think this is most likely the case because I'm going to show it to you here from the Scripture. He basically thought, well, everything is going well with my life. Everything is hunky-dory. I have gotten up. I got a son now. That all the blessings will be on him, Ishmael, and, and everything is fine. And maybe God needed to wait until he can come in and shake Abraham out of his comfort zone. Please listen to me. Smooth waters in our lives don't necessarily always mean that all is well with our relationship with the Lord. Conversely, problems, difficulties, tough times, when you feel the wind blowing in your face, doesn't mean that God is angry with you. Be very careful. Be very careful. Now, these are circumstances and criterions by which we judge each other, by which we deal with each other. And unfortunately, we take those same things and we impose them on God. And God doesn't work that way. The reason I believe that Abraham placed all of his future hope on Ishmael and not on God's promise that he's going to give him a son through Sarah is found in verse 18. If you have it in your Bible, you can underline that verse. Verse 18. Let me give you a use of translation. Ishmael will do. Oh, that Ishmael might be the one. Verse 19. I don't know how many times I haven't counted. God said again, read my lips. <laughs> again, this is my translation. It's not in your Bible. Sarah's the one. She's the one who's going to give you a child. Because from the descendants of Sarah is going to come my beloved son, the Messiah. And throughout the 2,000-year history, people try to eliminate the people of God. But God protected them because the son is yet to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. God is saying to him, I want to shake you from your satisfaction with Ishmael. On his 99th birthday, the Lord appears to Abraham. And beloved, this is the first time that God identified himself as El Shaddai. Can you say that with me? El Shaddai. This is the God of power and might. The God of power and might. What is God saying to Abraham and why he identified himself specifically as El Shaddai? As if he say to Abraham, Abraham, I don't need you to improvise on my plan. <laughs> I only need your obedience. Abraham, I don't need you to improve my image to society like so many preachers are trying to do today. Just obey my word. 
Abraham, I am fully able to fulfill all of my promises. I only need your acquiescence. You know, throughout the series of messages, I had people ask questions. When I talked first in the early days, the first of the series, about how the covenant of God, covenant with Abraham was unilateral, and how that covenant is eternal, and how this covenant is out of the graciousness of God. And the question that was raised, what's our response? What's our part? I see, we always like to take credit for something. Come on now. God can do it all by himself. Now, you don't think that way, but other people do. Can salvation take place without my cooperation with God? As I said, I'm so glad that question was asked because I love to answer it. <laughs> Listen very carefully. On the one hand, our God is a sovereign God. He's a God who's in control. And one of my life verses, one of, one of the anchors in the Scripture, the verses that anchors me in the Scripture is Ephesians 1.11, that God accomplishes all things according to the counsel of His will. On the other hand, God demands our response. In verse 3, God said, as for me, I will, I will, I will. In verse 9, he says, as for you, you do this. There's another contrast here in chapter 17. I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. God said, I will, seven times. How many? Seven times. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. <laughs> then he immediately says to Abraham, you must. You see, today in the New Testament times, when God saves us, he regenerates us. He regenerates us. Now, don't let anybody tell you that the, the spirit inside of you was in a coma or half asleep or taking a nap. The Bible said it was dead, 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 dead. And so the Holy Spirit has to come in and wake you up, <laughs> raise you up first. Before he can justify us, he regenerates us. He changes our hearts first. So we see, oh, Lord, I am a sinner heading for hell. Forgive me. And we respond to his love. He regenerates us, then he justifies us. If grace does not make us differ from other men, it's not the grace which God gives to the elect, his elect. And there may be somebody here who's visiting with us today, many probably watching around the world, and I don't know where you stand. I don't know where you are. But if you are not living for God, if you're not loving God, if you're not obeying the Word of God, it could be an indication that you have never been regenerated. In fact, your obedience and your love for God and your love for His Word is the only evidence that you have become born again believer. And I pray to God if there's one person or two or however many and have not been generated, but you come here because God wants to have an encounter with you and God is speaking to you and he's saying, I want to bring you to myself. That you say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. And that is why God changed Abraham's name from Abraham, the father of many, to Abraham, the father of multitudes. Please understand, Abraham's obedience did not contribute to the covenant. Did you get that? Well, let me repeat it just in case. Abraham's obedience did not contribute anything to the covenant. Can I get an amen? amen. In fact, the opposite is true. The opposite is true. The cutting away of the flesh signifies the renouncing of human effort. The cutting away of the flesh signifies the renouncing of the work of the flesh, the renouncing of identifying with anyone else except Yahweh. In many ways, the Lord's Supper is like that. 
The Lord's Supper is our testimony to the world that we believe we cannot save ourselves, that only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross 2,000 years ago can we be saved. It is our testimony to the world that we cannot live this life without his strength, that we come to declare our dependence on Jesus, that we are declaring that we believe that we cannot go to heaven without the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We cannot participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb without the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But verse 1 of chapter 17 is really the key verse to the entire dialogue that has taken place between God and Abraham. I am El Shaddai. Can you say it again? Walk blamelessly before me. What does that mean? It means that God is asking Abraham, and I believe with all my heart, is asking every one of us here today to trust in his words implicitly to trust in his promises unconditionally, to trust in his plan completely, to stop trying to improve on God's plan. But then he goes to 18, verse 18, and he says to God, after God said, I will bless you, I will do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, he he said, Ishmael will do. I just bless him. He's already here. Until you get to 15 and 16, and God it really keeps hammering away, keeps hammering away. And finally, after that, Abraham gets it. <laughs> this is what's happening here. It's amazing how God responds to Abraham's request of letting Ishmael be the one. He said, Let me say it one more time. (laughs) As for Sarah, Abraham, my friend, where have you been? (laughs) I've been trying to tell you this for the last 25 years. Abraham, when will you get it? Abraham, how can I make it clearer for you? When will you understand that I'm El Shaddai, that I'm the God of power and might, that I'm the God to whom nothing is impossible. I am the God of power and glory. I am the God who clicked his fingers and zillions of galaxies began to dance in their places. I am the God who tells the rain to fall. I'm the God who tells the sun to shine. I'm the God who tells the star to move with precision in their orbits. And when Abraham gets it, God is going to give him a son through Sarah because that's how the seed in the singular, not the plural, that the son from the descendants of Isaac and Jacob is going to be no other than the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and billions of people throughout the world today identify with him and are blessed because that blessing that came to Abraham has gone through the seed of Abraham, Jesus. Let me plead with you. Let me plead with you. Don't settle in your Christian walk and ministry. Don't settle. Because God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And God, beloved, bless us individually and bless us as a church only for one purpose, and that we may be a blessing to others. He doesn't bless us so we can form a bless me club. No. No. Abraham, my blessing for you shall be so overwhelming for me that through you the blessings are going to flow to many, many, many generations. My beloved friend, the Bible makes it clear that God blesses us so that we may be a blessing. Let me ask you, are you holding on to your blessings so tight You're almost ready to choke it. Hello. Are you cuddling your blessings? Or are you sharing it? Open hands, open hearts. Here's the thing I'm going to say to you as I'm getting ready to close. If you are not experiencing an overwhelming blessings of God 
It could be, and I'm saying it could be, I'm not making a statement, I'm saying a possibility. It could be because you have ceased to be a blessing to others. Be very careful. Be very careful with those eyes I have seen in the last 41 years in the ordained ministry, how blessings can develop wings and fly when they are held on to so tightly. But I want you finally to notice verse 23. After God stopped talking with Abraham and God left him, what did Abraham say? Okay, Lord, I'll do that in the by and by. Okay, Lord, I'll do that next year or next month. Okay, Lord, <laughs> I will do this when things get easy. Things are rough right now. Okay, Lord, I, I, I'm going to do this when, when my circumstances change. Okay, Lord, I'm, I, I'm going to do this, but when times are appropriate, the Bible said he immediately obeyed and circumcised his household. Let me go back to where I started. You may be experiencing the silence of God right now, and you're wondering why. It could be because he wants to shake you out of your complacency, out of your comfort zone. 